Euh, donc nous reprenons euh, nos activités euh, pour cette dernière demi-journée de, euh, de ce colloque consacré à la connaissance des essences et euh, à la connaissance philosophique. Euh, et donc nous reprenons cet après-midi euh, avec euh, Anna Marmodoro, qui occupe depuis 2016 la chaire de métaphysique au département de philosophie de l'université de de Ham, au Royaume-Uni. Elle est également membre associée de la faculté de philosophie de l'université d'Oxford et ses recherches se concentrent dans le domaine de la métaphysique et dans celui de la philosophie antique et, et médiévale. Elle a publié des monographies, ouvrages collectifs et articles dans euh, chacun de ces domaines. On mentionnera notamment « Forms and structure in Plato's metaphysics »,« Everything in everything », Anaxagoras Metaphysics et Metaphysics and Introduction to Contemporary Debate and Their History. Son exposé s'intitule The Athens of Power. Thank you very much, Benoit, for this kind introduction. Merci beaucoup. I want to express my warmest thanks to Claudine Terslan for this invitation. That it's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Alexander, for the technical support. Um, and I'm going to speak in English. So uh, I'm Italian. I'm going to speak in English. If I speak too fast, just say. I combine an English accent with an Italian speech. Right. Um, so what I want to contribute to our thinking in these two days about metaphysics and epistemology of essence is some thoughts about the essence of properties and in particular uh, dispositional properties or as you will hear in the course of my talk, powers, capacities, dispositions. I'm not differentiating them today. So um, to introduce you to my topic, I'll just do it the usual way, starting from a claim that many, I think, are uh, inclined to share, that uh, uh, causation is what holds the universe together. Maki said um, it is the cement of the universe. The question is, what is it that powers up causation? What is it that keeps causal mechanisms sticking on? So the question is fundamental and the answers diverge. So in contemporary metaphysics, I think we can uh, uh, fairly say that there are at least two um, major trends in thinking about causation. One is the Humean, new or neo Humean um, trend, according to which, as you see um, epitomized here, all that causation consists in is regularity, continuity, uh, uh, temporal priority of the cause and the effect, and nothing else. Um, the alternative is uh, what I call here a powerful account of causation. Causation is the exercise of causal powers. Now, essentially, oh, sorry, uh, importantly for my talk, causal powers are dynamic entities. Uh, causal powers power up causation because uh, causation uh, is a dynamic thing. Uh, and uh, um, dynamism is precisely, I think, what uh, differentiates uh, Humean and or neo Humean accounts of possession from uh, powerful accounts of possession. According to this picture of the world, it, the world seems pretty uh, static. It's just a succession of uh, uh, moments in time. Uh, according to that account, each moment is followed by another moment by there being something that powers up the change from one moment to the other. So powerful possession has at least as one of its advantages uh, the fact that it affords us an explanation of what's different between causal regularities and regularities that are not um, uh, causal. Now, uh, many of you here are experts on causation, so I'm happy to expand on that in discussion. But here, um, what really interests me is that if you buy into a, this account of causation as powered up by causal powers, then uh, you place powers at the center of uh, an, the explanation of a phenomenon, namely causation, that is a center of our um, natural philosophy. And uh, so here I have a quotation by um, uh, Barbara Vetter, who uh, um, uh, just expresses this thought that for those who are anti-humians, i.e. those who believe in causal powers, these positions of powers are central explanants. Uh, rather than a problematic explanandum. And I very much agree with that. I'm on board with that claim. Powers explain things for us. Uh, they explain causation, and I think they even explain model phenomena, which have been discussed earlier today. But I'm going to now uh, differentiate my position from that of uh, Vetter, among others, uh, b uh, by claiming that the explanation that causal powers provide comes with a cost. 
And we need to assess that cost and decide where we are on board with that cost. And the cost is that uh, those who posit causal powers um, posit in the ontology something that is has primitively built into it uh, uh, whatever power need to have in order to do what they do. So uh, powers are entities that uh, um, do what they do uh, due to their uh, intrinsic nature, but this nature is primitive, uh, and that comes uh, that brings a cost to this option. So uh, when we say that powers provide explanations, or they are explanations, um, we uh, achieve explanations by paying the cost of adding primitives to our ontology. That's the main thing I'm going to argue here. And what I want to discuss with you is whether this cost is worth bearing and why. So uh, causal powers, what are they? Uh, well, causal powers are properties that uh, exist in the world and characterize objects. For example, the magnetic power of a magnet. Now, what's interesting about these properties is that they can exist uh, as inactive, so a magnetic um, uh, power that is inactive is doing nothing, uh, or activated or active, namely, uh, for example, attracting or repelling uh, metal if we're thinking about the magnet. And when powers are activated, they, uh, or their possessor, bring about change. So this is what is distinctive about them, that they can be inactive or activated, and when activated, they bring about change. Now, what's interesting here is that by thinking of powers this way, power metaphysicians um, built change into the very definition of power. So a typical definition of powers is going to look like this. A type of power is essentially defined by the type of change it or its possessor uh, can bring about. And uh, uh, here is my claim. When we uh, explain change in terms of powers, we basically uh, explain change on account of the presence of the relevant powers exercising inappropriate circumstances. But as much as I am a friend of powers, I also think uh, we uh, need to say more to explain how, uh, by the presence of a power that is active, change comes about in the world. And you know, those who are not friends of powers say, look, that looks quite a miracle. Uh, you have a glass, you strike the glass, uh, the glass breaks. How is it that the glass breaks? Because it's fragile. Well, that doesn't explain much, does it? I mean, that's a, the objection that we usually get, we friends of powers. So I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Yes, indeed, I think we should. But it's not as easy as it seems. Uh, the crux of the problem is to explain, I think, metaphysically, how something that is inactive brings about activity and change. So remember, this is what is typical or essential to causal powers. They exi can exist uh, in inactive and can be activated, but how is it that they transition from inactive to active? And this has to be something within the power, because if we uh, uh, use external circumstances, triggers, and so on and so forth to explain how the power gets activated, we basically deprive the power itself of its causal oomph. So it has to be within the power, uh, but here is my claim, if it is uh, within the power, it is something that we do not know and we cannot know, and this makes powers essentially um, uh, black boxes to us, and that's going to be um, uh, what I'm going to elaborate here. So uh, I'm going to sketch this proposal as to how we, uh, I think, should approach uh, the metaphysics of powers. This is a proposal that uh, comprises four uh, claims. So. I think we have plenty of evidence from science and plenty of arguments from metaphysics that give us reasons to posit powers or capacities, dispositions or forces, if you want to use that term, as fundamental dynamic entities uh, in our ontology. So I want to be a realist with respect to causal powers. I think there is enough to convince us that it's a good move. But I want to temper that optimistic realist claim with uh, what I call here metaphysical humility. Namely, neither metaphysics or science um, has offered, or I think can offer, a reductive account of the dynamism of powers. And if no account can be given, I think our stance should be that powers are primitively dynamic. Uh, so uh, they are fundamental entities, they are dynamic, but there is 
that, that's rock bottom. There is no further explanation we can give of what makes them dynamic and therefore really explains how they transition from inactive to active. Now, a question you may want to raise here is this. So if um, we uh, need powers to explain change in the world, but then powers happen to be uh, primitive entities, uh, is it, um, and, that, and, and so there is nothing we can find out about their nature beyond the fact that they are so, is it game over? Should we stop t caring about, uh, you know, getting to know powers? And uh, here is um, something that uh, I think will sound unexpected. I think we should still make an epistemic commitment to powers. Namely, even if we cannot look into the black box that powers are, and we cannot because powers are primitively dynamic, still um, we should uh, uh, work on understanding and classifying what powers do, because that's useful for scientific prediction and sort of vindicates the role that, that powers can have in our science and therefore also in our metaphysics. So the overall argument that uh, I'll, I'll try to um, sketch here is that uh, um, uh, if we think of causation as something we want to give an explanation of, so we leave aside the human and the human perspective and we take a realist approach of causation and we place powers at the core of the, uh, that explanation of causation, we basically um, gain an explanation explan an of an explanandum, namely causation, at the cost of taking that explanance to be a metaphysical primitive, something that uh, is not reducible to anything else, and it is also an epistemic black box to us. So metaphysical primitive, epistemic black box. And uh, uh, admitting this primitive, which is also a black box to us, uh, challenges and maybe even limits our understanding of nature. That is true. Nevertheless, I want to say, I want to contend that this, this is not a reason to dismiss to core a power-based account of possession because of the black box, we can still know how it behaves in certain circumstances. This is useful for um, uh, doing science and making predictions. So if we know that certain powers put together will behave in a certain way, we know to, how to build a causal mechanism, for example. And that's useful. That's enough of a reason, I think, for wanting to have causal powers in the picture. Now. Uh, so far, I simply claim that powers are metaphysically primitive. I have not given you much of a reason. So what I'm going to uh, do is to develop a little bit of an inductive argument. And I'm going to look at some of the main accounts that have been tried out to explain what there is inside the, the black box. And I'll try to show that none of these accounts has worked out. Now, of course, this leaves open the possibility that other accounts may be developed in the future, but I think also warrants some pessimism that uh, uh, an account can be given. So let's look at some accounts. Remember, what we're looking for is something that explains how something that is inactive becomes active. And this has to be within the power, okay? And uh, um, so some have tried to say that uh, um, the uh, dynamism of powers can be explained by something more primitive than powers themselves, and that is by re resorting to an old-fashioned idea, that of telos, or end, or goal. And so some have said, well, look, uh, powers are dynamic. This means that there are telic properties. There are property that, properties that have an end or a telos, a natural telos, and uh, their de being dynamic is simply having that telos. So like a human being, uh, as, as an embryo, as the telos of becoming an adult, so powers have this built-in telos that is their exercise or manifestation. Uh, so here is a concrete example of this approach. This is by Nick Kroll. Um, I gave you there a couple of quotations and I made uh, yellow the important bits. So Kroll is trying to explain this transition between uh, powers as inactive and powers as activated in terms of uh, the power being a state directed to the end that the power uh, uh, M's, namely manifests. And then he gives this example. So um, uh, uh, salt has the disposition to uh, be soluble, which means that uh, in virtue of that disposition, um, salt is in a state directed at the end that it dissolves. But think carefully about 
how Kroll expresses himself. I think you'll spot the problem that I see there. So it seems to me that uh, um, he thinks that positing the power sartelic properties is a way of explaining their dynamism. But basically, what is in fact doing is to use the telos of a power uh, to um, uh, talk about the result of the manifestation. So you see here, the telos is that it dissolves, but that is the result of the power of solubility being activated, it's the end state, so to speak. So it tells us nothing about what happens going from inactive to active, it's only telling us something about what it is once the power has been activated and has manifested. So um, I think here there is an implicit mistake, which is to identify the telos of a power or disposition with the result of the exercise uh, or, or manifestation of that uh, uh, power. And so this kind of telic properties approach, in fact, tells us nothing about how the power will exercise. It just tells us what will happen once the power has started exercising. What will happen is that the salt will be solved dissolved, That's, um, but that doesn't tell us anything about how it goes from being inactive to being actively doing something. So I think the question is still uh, open, and what we need to do is to uh, look inside, you know, if there, within the power, not without the power. Uh, the teleological approach looks at the telos as the end point of that uh, process of activation, but the uh, end process is outside the power itself. It doesn't tell us anything about the causal oomph of the power. Are there alternatives? Well, of course, you know, um, the literature on powers is enormous and alternatives have been tried. So here is another one. Um, uh, many uh, talk about powers and properties that are directed, and this being directed is understood to be the source of their dynamism. So you probably have seen many times in the literature this way of talking, a power of type P is directed towards its manifestation or exercise of type M. Now, this approach is better than the previous one because uh, what the power is directed to on this approach is not the result of the exercise, but the exercise itself. So if we went back to the case of salt, uh, 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 the solubility of salt is directed towards its dissolving, not towards the state of having been dissolved. So there is some progress here, uh, but of course what directedness is, is a matter of debate. And a proposal that uh, many like is that uh, um, directness is a type of physical intentionality. Uh, this uh, view has been popular with many since the 90s. Um, many have objected to it. Uh, I uh, think that uh, um, thinking about the directness of powers as uh, physical intentionality is at best a metaphor. So as long as we consider it a metaphor, maybe useful, but it's nothing more than that. So my thoughts against the um, uh, using physical intentionality to explain the directness of powers are summarized there. I think, um, and you know, I'm very pleased Francois is here because he can tell us more about intentionality. Intentionality to begin with is not even well understood within the philosophy of mind. So it seems awkward to try to use a concept that is problematic within the philosophy of mind to explain something in the physical uh, world. Uh, secondly, uh, many say that uh, if we attribute intentionality to physical property, properties, it is as if we consider them mental entities that uh, can be in some sort of state, mental state about the world, a representational state about the world, and that also seems uh, misguided. But the further objection I have is that suppose that it would be supposed, per hypothesis, that it were useful to think of directness as intentionality. Well, intentionality is nothing dynamic about it. You know, I may be thinking about this desk or maybe thinking about the coffee, um, but um, the fact that my thought is directed towards coffee is nothing dynamic about it as such. So I have. Um, uh, reasons to be uh, to wanting to oppose this account of directness in terms of intentionality, and I think it's a type of approach that doesn't solve our problem, the crucial problem of explaining how powers can be entities that can change from being inactive to being active. 
Of course, um, alternatively, uh, we, uh, others have thought about directness, not in terms of intentionality, but rather identity fixing relations. So a power of type P is directed towards a manifestation of type M. This means that M is what fixes the identity of P. And uh, uh, then uh, the question is, what does this mean and does this solve our uh, problem? There are a variety of positions in the literature. Uh, one that is uh, uh, well uh, known um, is the one of Alexander Bird, so we can start from that. Uh, so for Bird, the power P is a relational property whose manifestation is fixed by the relation that P holds with uh, uh, other relational properties. And then we quickly get, oh, sorry, I think, yeah, and that we, click, we quickly get into this kind of picture the world is a web of relations, and powers are these nodes, the point of the crossing point among relations. But apart from any difficulty you might have with the relational world, it's very unclear to me how thinking of powers this way and their directness, this relational way, is very unclear to me how it tells us anything about the dynamicity of powers. It just gives us a picture, a description of the world, but doesn't explain how the world changes from one state to the other. So it doesn't seem to me uh, very uh, useful, at least for the purpose of explaining, if possible, uh, what is it that uh, makes powers dynamic. Now, a slightly less uh, known alternative way of thinking about the identity fixing relation is that it was discussed by Psyllos a while ago. Uh, so Psyllos says, well, power uh, type P is directed towards manifestation type M, but manifestation type M has to be a categorical property, otherwise regresses follow. And of course, you can see how damaging this move is for the friends of powers because now you have a power whose essence is defined by uh, non-powerful properties. So it's like building inertness into the, you know, the essence of powers. So that's not very promising and there are lots of discussions uh, in the literature of why this doesn't uh, work. So uh, I'm going to take you through one more uh, alternative, um, that is the idea that uh, maybe the relation between a power and its manifestation or exercise is a relation of production. So powers are related to their manifestation or exercise in a productive way. And the thought uh, behind this is that um, implicitly at least, according to the you know, Oxford Cambridge dictionaries and so on and so forth, you know, it's kind of common sense, maybe Jean-Louis, uh, Jean um, but this would say it's common sense to think that uh, uh, causes are uh, producers, that to cause is to produce. And therefore, if powers are causes, they are productive ones. And I think this is progress in the sense that uh, if we uh, think this way, we uh, shift our attention more on the dynamics of power. Producing is doing something. So it's, you know, we begin to go a bit closer to the problem, I think. But what is it that the power does uh, when, uh, uh, what is it the power does to become active? That is my problem, right? What is it that the power does to go from inactive to active? So not what the power does when the power is already active, and then is exercising and producing something, but rather what is, the power, what is it that the power does between the moment it is inactive and the power at the moment in which it is active? And uh, uh, it's interesting that I think um, understanding this issue about activity as productivity has uh, um, uh, had a number of uh, um, uh, publications devoted to it recently. I'm here referring only to Bachmann. He um, thinks that any power ontology is supposed to be productive. So that's the only way he thinks uh, we should think about powers. Forget all the others. Uh, uh, they're not dynamic enough. It's only if we think of powers as productive that we can think of them as dynamic entities. So at least I think you know, people like Bachmann have a sensitivity to the dynamism of powers. Uh, now, of course, Bachmann in particular uses this idea that powers need to be productive to generate a reductio uh, ad absurdum of powers. And he thinks that if powers are productive, then uh, their ontology is incompatible with any theory of time we might have. And that is a very good reason for dropping powers. Right? So things, according to Bachmann, things go really wrong. Um, if we think that powers are productive, but at the same time he thinks there is no other way 
of thinking of powers other than productive. And what intrigued me, particularly in his account, is that he thinks the culprit is this uh, idea uh, that uh, powers engage in some activity. And he says this is such a central idea to the neo-Aristotelian view. And you know, feeling myself quite sympathetic to neo-Aristotelianism, I thought, well, let's just look into this in a bit more detail. So I think, as I say, there is something right in focusing attention on activity, but there is something wrong here in identifying the activity of powers with productivity. And um, here is our little uh, dispute. So he uh, thinks that um, I'm uh, talking of powers as if they were agents, and so I'm committed to this idea that powers are producers, and therefore I'm also committed to this reductio ad absurdum where um, uh, um, uh, uh, powers are incompatible with any accepted theory of time. And I think, no, activity is different from production. And we know this even from Aristotle's time. I mean, for those of you who know ancient Greek, Poyen and Prasen are different uh, things. So uh, I think uh, that uh, an exercising or manifesting power is uh, the same, numerically same power as it was when it was inactive. That's a really important point for me. So the magnet that is doing nothing and the magnet that is attracting metal has one and the numerically same power, but that power is in different states. So when the power is exercising, it's not producing anything else, it's just exercising. It's like I'm moving my hands. You know, the power is doing something, but that doing is not... Uh, being productive is simply uh, being active. Uh, and uh, uh, we should differentiate the activity of a power from the result of that activity. So uh, the, the power is doing something, and uh, the, the magnet, for example, has the ma magnetic power activated, and it's attracting metal, and metal comes closer. Okay, so uh, attracting metal is the activity of the power, metal getting closer is the result of that activity. So if we distinguish this, um, uh, we, uh, I think we make progress. We can talk about exercise of power as different from the product of a power. And um, uh, remember, um, it, if we think of powers as, as producing their exercise, we divorce powers from anything that is dynamic about them, because their exercise is their activity, but if they are related to their activity in terms of producing it, it looks like the power is you know, quite you know, inert itself. It's just producing its own exercise, but it doesn't have it within it, and it's quite hard to understand how it would produce it. So let me take uh, briefly uh, stock. Um, we uh, set out together investigating what I think is really the cracks of the metaphysics of powers. Um, powers are uh, dynamic entities. Now, what is it for them to be dynamic? Uh, it has to be something within the power that explains their oomph, their, uh, their causal oomph, their dynamism. Now, Many have tried in the literature explicitly or implicitly to try to explain what is it that gives powers this oomph, inner oomph. But all the accounts that exist, um, at least to date, I think uh, fail to deliver the solution we want. Uh, the teleological accounts um, talk about what happens at the end of the exercise of power. The um, uh, intentionality accounts uh, make use of a notion from the philosophy of mind that is problematic within metaphysics. And the um, identity fixing accounts are also problematic because they give us a non-dynamic picture of the world. The productive account, I think, is the best we have on the market, as it were, because it just focuses more on the dynamics of powers, uh, but doesn't explain it and faces difficulties. So I think I can do better uh, by saying that the power that is exercising is numerically the same as the power that is inactive. So I kind of bridge that gap between power and activity by saying it is one and the same power in two states. It's not a power that produces its activity. It's a power that is active, is doing things. But I also recognize to Kwakwe, you know, my account too um, suffers from difficulties. Uh, and uh, in previous work, I myself 
uh, describe the directness of powers in terms of readiness for action. So that's how I spoke about the dynamics of powers, that powers are entities that are ready to act. Um, and I entirely recognize that this is a metaphor. So if I accuse my opponents of using metaphors, I'm here saying I've used them too. But uh, in my defense, I want to say um, uh, that uh, uh, I think uh, uh, this metaphor of readiness for action is justified because uh, there is simply nothing more fundamental, more primitive than powers themselves that we can use to explain the dynamicity of power. So the difference between what I'm proposing as, as my account and the other ones we are seeing is that the others think they can explain the dynamics of powers without realizing that what they do is to offer metaphors or accounts that are problematic. While I'm saying, yes, I'm using a metaphor, but this is to explicitly recognize that the dynamics of powers is primitive. There is simply nothing more uh, rock bottom in the ontology that can be used to explain the dynamics of powers. So, uh, and that makes sense, in, because if powers are the bedrock of reality, it really makes sense that there is nothing more primitive than them that we can use to explain how they are uh, dynamic. So, um, my sort of take home lesson from this discussion of alternative accounts is that um, I think there is a real uh, uh, issue to face for friends of powers, namely what is it that uh, explains the dynamism of powers. But um, the fact that so many good attempts in the literature have failed to deliver an account of the dynamism of powers tells us, I think, that uh, um, uh, the dynamism of power is ontologically primitive and uh, their behavior is epistemologically a black box to us. So we don't no, and we cannot know what is it that gets the power going from inactive to active. Uh, and so um, it is my connection with some of the issues discussed in the past two days. Uh, we are blind to the essence of powers epistemology. We, we can't get to know it. But that doesn't mean that we should drop powers from our ontology because powers retain a lot of usefulness uh, in providing explanations of uh, um, what happens uh, in nature. I think instead of keep trying to understand what there is within this black box, which is unopenable to us, we should focus on how powers behave and empirically find out that you know a glass uh, that is fragile breaks in certain conditions and then you know we can kind of take care of it, for example. So we should focus our epistemic uh, um, interest in learning what powers do, uh, in which circumstances, and classifying powers for useful predictions. Uh, accepting that ontologically speaking, powers are uh, primitive. So my sort of uh, conclusion, conclusion line is the following. Um, what I think I'm contributing to these enormous discussions of power metaphysics today is the claim that uh, uh, the dynamics of power is an irreducible feature of this property. So if we accept powers, we accept something dynamic in the ontology that is primitively so. Uh, this is a cost. Every time we import the primitive in the ontology, we pay uh, a price, but uh, uh, we also get the benefit. Uh, the benefit is that we can explain change in the world by connecting change and powers. Now, uh, and we can learn how uh, certain powers uh, 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 explain certain changes in the world in certain circumstances. Now, this limits our understanding of nature because saying that there is something primitive at the bedrock and that is a black box to us limits our understanding of nature. Nevertheless, um, it's epistemically uh, worthwhile to uh, think about powers um, uh, accepting this black box situation because we can use powers for predictions. So it's, um, the upshot conclusion is yes to powers provided that we know what the, the cost is, namely a primitive in the ontology and the black box in epistemology with respect to the essences. Thank you very much indeed.